speaker is Dr. Meijin Zhu. She's an associate professor of food safety at WSU, and she'll be talking to us about recent food safety recalls and risks. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so today, and uh, we know, my my talk is kind of you know narrow down a little bit. We are focused on biological controls, and we know for the food safety we have a lot to cover. And so I just ask, what is your number one passages in your mind at this moment? Is this listeria something? So today's talk will mainly focus on listeria monocytogen, and I'm coming to the risk recall interventions, and we'll give you some, you know, little bit of histories. And start with, I will talking about, you know, two, you know, listeria species. And so probably, you know, most of you are, you know, familiar with listeria monocytogens. And I don't know whether you, so this listeria, you know, inocua is physically is using for as, you know, kind of surrogate. So physically, you know, we know the listeria monocytogen is, you know, highly volulent and causing a lot, you know, foodborne illness. And this listeria monocytogen physically is intracellular. That means it can grow inside our cells. That means it's very volulent. But the listeria inocua is very similar to listeria monocytogen, but it's not pathogenic. That's why we're using it as an indicator organisms. And so, Follow down there is a lot of other listeria species. So that's, you know, take home message is when we're talking about the listeria, it's not everything is pathogenic. It's only listeria monocytogen is highly virulent. Okay. So listeria silo taping is a universal accepted subtyping method for the listeria monocytogen, and usually it's based on their you know surface protein as well as uh, you know flagella additives. And uh, literally, literally, there is about fourteen sealer tapes, and so effect us is about three sealer tapes. It's mostly is a major cause of the foodborne illness. And so this is kind of on the FDA you know, uh, CDC. Data and you can indicate, you know, 4B, half A, and half B is mainly listeria celotype involved in the foodborne illness. And so the question coming is why we care about the listeria, and because listeria is widely spread in the environment, and we can find in the soil, water, switch, and it can find in the animal feeds, animal, you know, sheddings, intestinal check. And it's also can find in the vegetables if we, you know, vegetable is grown in the contaminated soils. And so it's also pretty universally existing in our processing environment and catering facilities. And so the history is listeria, you know, as a pathogen, it's pretty new compared, you know, to others. And it's identified, you know, in the in 1926 by the Dr. Rod Lister. And then is widely recognized as a foodborne illness since 1980s. And it's, we all know it's called foodborne illness, listeriolosis. And traditionally, listeriolosis is more common as a sporadic disease, but now becoming an outbreak a lot. And so it's, anyone think of why? And so I will hold this for a little bit, but we will see because right now at definitely because we test more and we you know, examine more and we pay attention more. And another thing why it's sporadic and I will give that some examples when we go through the presentations. And so when I look at this you know, data and you can see, you know, compare with other foodborne illness, this TLA is not a lot of illness compare with others, compare with Salmonella, compare with Campylobacter. And each year there is about you know, more than 1,000 illness. But when you look at the death, the listeria is causing, causing more than, you know, it's causing even though illness is not a lot, but the death is a lot. So that means, you know, the mortality is very high 
compare with other foodborne illness. The mortality is about, you know, in this, in this chart, it's about 16, and if you go down, it can be high as 30%. So that means it's, you know, even though it's less chance to have the steer illness, but its mortality is very high. So who are susceptible to the, you know, Listeria monocytogens? Mostly, you know, elderly, newborns, infants, and it can be, you know, also immune compromised people, like IH, cancer patient, organ transplant, and, you know, have a metabolic disease. And the unique to other all foodborne illness, listeria, susceptible is one of the pregnant women. And if the pregnant woman there is about more than 20 times likely get the listeria losis. And so here is, I show you the chart. You can see, you know, the pregnant woman is, you know, up, up in high on the, on the charts. And so elderly is next. The overall incidence is fairly low. And so this is, you know, very unique on that. And so if we exclude this pregnant woman, and you can see the elderly, it's, you know, more chance of the listeriosis infections. So the symptom of the listeria is mild flu-like illness, nauseous, headache, and persistent fevers. So this is, uh, you know, generally, but in the, you know, extreme case can be have brain infections, blood infections. And so we talk about, you know, unique susceptible persons is on the pregnant women. And so you can see that for the pregnant women itself, it's kind of flu-like illness, but, and so the damage they can go to the babies. So can cause the spontaneous disease, miscarriage, and stillborns, and a lot of different things, you know, associated with babies. That's why, you know, it's dangerous coming from, and that's why it's unique coming from. So now coming with also another unique thing is this TLA has long incubation times. And we say incubation time is the time we ingest contaminated food to, you know, that we can onset symptoms. So this period is very long for the Listeria monocytogen, and it can be from three days to 70 days, and average is about three weeks. So with this, and so we know if I ask you what you eat one month ago, probably we, probably no one can remember exactly, right? That's why, you know, in the very beginning, I say, you know, Listeria outbreak is less reported because of you know, less kind of you know, illness. And it's also because of long time ago and go and now and then. So we can't recognize which food is causing the, you know, Listeriosis. So a, a good example I'm showing here is this year's, you know, blue, uh, bluebell ice cream outbreak. And you can see, you know, there is a 10 cases here. And the first case traced back is 2010. So the physically, because, you know, the data, because of our, you know, uh, survey, football surveillance data trace back and go back to here. And so if without this good record tra tracing back systems, and probably we will not recognize this is associated with outbreak. So this, you know, is a challenge on the listia as well. Any questions? So most of the times we got listia, you know, monocytogen is through foodborne illness. And this can be a raw food. Obviously, right now we don't, you know, have this practice. And undercooked meat, processed food, dairy meat, unpasteurized milk, dairy products, and we do have outbreak with cantaloupes, couple apples, and other fruit, fruit produce. And a major, you know, that's why Listeria monocytogen is a major food safety concern to ready to eat meat. And historically, it's associated with ready to eat meat. And I will give you a couple of big examples on the, you know, Listeria outbreak associated with ready to eat meat. And then I will carry it over to the why Listeria associated with ready to eat food, including our fruit, fruit and flesh produce. 
So now historically, if we go back in the 1988 to 1989, there is a huge outbreak of the listeria is associated with the Frank and dairy meats. And there is about more than 100 cases, 21 deaths. That means mortality is more than 20. And then follow the next, you know, in the 2000, and it's also associated with dairy meat. And in that case, it's around 30 cases, four deaths and seven stillbirths. And then, you know, go down next, you know, it's put close, it's, but it's still related, it's outbreak with dairy meat. It's have the 50 case, eight deaths and three stillborns. And so, you know, you can see, you know, pregnant woman is, you know, affect with babies. So now getting closer to the, you know, to getting more closer to here is, you know, 2008, Canada, there is, you know, the steel outbreak in Delmeter again, and there is about 20 deaths out of the 56 cases. So all those things together and then give us the question why listeria is a big issue to the ready to eat food, ready to eat meat. And we all know meat is cooked, right? So is listeria heat resistant? Probably not. And then where is this come from? So now I would like to share with you some characteristics of the listeria and then just to why this is issue to our fresh produce. So the first thing obviously as some little bit of micro of the list, microbiological background on the Listeria monocytogen. Listeria is gland positive, facultative, anaerobic. That means Listeria can grow in the air pack or vacuum packed foods. And it's also grow temperature. It can grow from zero to 42 degree. And this gives us the opportunity. Think about most of our fresh produce is stored in the refrigerator. And the listeria can grow in the refrigerator because it's, and so there is a date here, as you can see chart, and you can see listeria can grow slowly during the refrigerated storages. So this becoming, uh, you know, issues on us. And so it's also can grow in the acidic environment. We all know the fruit is acidic, but it can tolerance acidic pH. And I also will show you one, you know, data has recently published in this year, listeria can grow in the apples, inside the caramel apples. And it's also listeria can tolerance the low water activity, and it's hollow tolerance. And we know this nitrate obviously is not relevant to the fresh produce, but it's is the ingredient specifically included in the ready to eat meat to control microorganism growth, but the listeria can tolerance it. And so, and another thing make, you know, listeria extreme case is it has ability to form the biofilm. This film is kind of slimy layers of the bacteria. It can grow the biofilm stick to our facilities. And that means it's not easy to clean and get rid of it. And so that's becoming listeria persistent in our environment, including processing or packing facilities. And this is causing a problem. So all those things together, if we regarding to the ready to eat meat settings, and because listeria is ubiquitous and persistent in the environment, and we all know after cooking, we handle our meats. And so this is relevant to produce because we handle it. That means during the handling, listeria can be contaminate our fruits or our products. And so this means it's difficult to avoid contaminations. And another big issue is listeria can grow in the refrigerated temperatures. This is where how we store our food. And this is causing the problems. And that means once it's contaminated, listeria will remain in hazard during the storage, whether it's refrigerated or in the frozen. I will talk later on. So that means this, and another important thing is because ready to eat food or meat 
it's we have relatively long shelf life. So that means it's still it can grow to the you know kind of has the levels to us. And regarding to the ready to eat meat, that's why there is zero tolerance and the same thing to the you know ready to eat food. And because of this, USDA you know have the requirement for three requirement to try to apply control the list areas. And so this, I will using this as example regarding to our how our fresh produce handling and control it. And our alternative one is you either including the post facility treatment, that means post packing kill step. And do we have it in the fresh produce? Probably we don't have it at this moment, right? And or you can include antimicrobials to inhibit the listeria growth. But for fresh produce, we can't do that. Does this make sense, right? So this is for the meat. And so and or another alternative you can do either ways. You can either have the kill step or you can inhibit it. But in most of the case in the fr fresh produce, we can't do that. So that's why there is alternative three is using the sanitary procedures and try to have a good practice, prevent contaminations and try to minimize, you know, load. So this, and obviously the risk we know is, you know, the alternative three will have a, you know, higher risks. And I also need to mention for this alternative, the USDA and FDA has a different, you know, rules on that. So regarding to this, you know, ready to eat meat, and obviously I showed this list, and you can see three, you know, big outbreak I showed in the very beginning, and so now we are pretty good. That means control and prevention take a role, and this is a regulatory success. So we do a good practice, and we control it. Even though in the beginning we have a big, huge outbreak in the ready to eat meat, and go down now, we are on the, you know, very good on here. So now, becoming, you know, you can see the listeria incidence, and we from high getting low, we are pretty good on the here. But the problem coming is fresh outbreak, linking to the, you know, listeria outbreaks. In the beginning, we say it's mostly in the ready to eat meat, now we get into the fresh produce. And so everybody in here probably still, you know, memory fresh on 2011 cantaloupe outbreak on the listeria. And in this list, yes, there is more than 140 cases and 33 deaths on here. So where is listeria come from? It's environmental. And when the FDA traced back, and they found the listeria from the environment. That's why we say because listeria is a ubiquity in the environment, that's why it's difficult for us to prevent contam contamination. And so this year, in the beginning of this year, there is listeria outbreak on the cameroma apples. And there is about, you know, 34 cases, seven deaths. And so now again, you can see that, you know, mortality of the listeria outbreak is very high on this. Yes. Uh, I, I haven't heard, uh, how, do you, how do you control if listeria is hard to control? How do you control it? How do you sanitize it? So that's why we need to have, that's very good questions. And actually this is a, right now we are more focused on fruit. We are trying to control it, literally, literally. So that's why we need to have good practice. Effective sanitizers. And, uh, but it's very effective is, you know, heat treatment. And so maybe some surface, fruit contact surface might be steam treated with something, you know, different alternative prevention method. If we're talking about, if we're talking about fresh, uh, uh, and, 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 and it sticks on stainless steel and everything else, uh, it sounds like it's a hard bugger to clean up. And, and so really what, uh, this, the, the way to clean it up, uh, I, I guess is what I'm looking at. 
Did you have it? We handle listeria in the produce industry a lot different than we handle other, other bacteria. The organisms of concern for the fresh produce industry are number one, salmonella, followed by E. coli and a whole number of, uh, of uh, other little bad guys. But they are different because those, those bacteria, their natural habitat, where they normally live is in the intestines of animals. Listeria is a soil-borne organism. And so it's everywhere. When you saw that word ubiquitous, that's just a fancy word meaning it's everywhere. I doubt that we've ever eaten a salad that didn't have some listeria in it. Fortunately, it takes an awful lot of them to get you sick. Unfortunately, it's a really nasty bug. It, it, uh, um, whereas less than 1% of 1% of people that uh, get sick from salmonella die, you might feel like you're going to die, but you don't. With uh, listeria, more than one in five people that get infected don't survive. It's, it's pretty nasty stuff. So since we know it's everywhere and it behaves differently than, than uh, the other organisms that we, you know, the other bacteria we have, to, we have to deal with, we actually, at our company, we actually uh, have two separate programs. We have a regular GAP and GMP programs, but we have a listeria control program. I'm sure Dr. Zhu will probably get into this, and, and I, I can talk about it more when, when I'm up, up on, on front. But we generally use a different set of chemicals. We use items like quaternary ammonia in our drains because it leaves a residue. And, and uh, I, uh, uh, we use um, the sanitizers that have peracids, uh, peroxyacetic acids uh, 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 and others uh, um, as the active ingredient because not only are they very effective against uh, listeria, they're also really effective against biofilm. Now, Doc, I, I don't, I don't want to get yeah, into your ahead. talk, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, biofilm is a little different. So, so these, 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 uh, uh, these bugs lie around there, and they actually help protect each other. They put out a polymer. Think of it like a plastic, and they live inside of it, and then they make you know, layers and layers and layers of it. So even when you do sanitize, you might only get the, uh, the top layer. Uh, that's that's one, of the main, one of the many dangers of biofilms. So well, you think, well, how is that dangerous? Well, every time you turn on a machine and there's a vibration, anytime you hit it with a brush, somebody touches it, anything happens – it releases more and more of them. So uh, um, the, uh, uh, the parasitic acid uh, sanitizers are really pretty effective at digging into those biofilms and just literally washing them away. And lastly, there's two groups of um, uh, listeria colonies that, um, that you want to be um, concerned with. One is uh, transient uh, Populations. That's a fancy word meaning that, okay, if it's everywhere, it's in the soil, you know there's going to be a little bit of it on the berries or whatever product you have coming into your plant. And, and um, not much you can do about that. But when they touch something, they, they leave their buddies there and they start to grow. That's where the danger is. We call those resident populations. So your sanit uh, sanitizing activities are meant to kill the resident populations. You don't want them to grow up to be gazillions of listeria organisms. You know, uh, you, if, if they're coming in, you know they're coming in and they're going out, but uh, just don't let them grow. Now, they're different also in another way in, in that when, when, you, uh, when you put something in a cooler or when you freeze it, you don't kill bacteria. What you do is you keep it from replicating. You slow it down so they can't reproduce. Unfortunately, listeria likes the cold, and they grow when other organisms don't, so they'll outcompete them. And, and if you don't kill them all, the ones that are left over are the strongest ones, and you've really got a problem. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, and we can get more into this uh, uh, on the last session. You're maybe saying, like, the acid? No, it, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you, you, can, you can buy for, from uh, your ag supply centers. They, they've got sanitizers. You know, Home Depot's got sanitizers, and, and uh, um, uh, these aren't the only ones. You know, at our company, like I say, we, we use quaternary ammonia in our drains. We like using it there. You can't use quaternary ammonia for any organic operations because... This seems like a good conversation to, uh, to have afterward, I think. Yeah, but this is different. This I think is different. We'll, let, so, we'll let Dr. Zhu continue, and we can continue this afterward. So for this come 
apple outbreak, and it's basically again, you know, the steering is isolated from the environmentals. And so here yeah, the question coming is, you know, is this a wrong? Is this just, you know, this two case on the fresh produce? Where is there other things associated with that? And so literally, literally you know, we do find the steering in different of the even in the apples, you know, there is glucose associated with stelia identifications. And then it goes through, you know, the stelia do outbreak as other fre fresh produce or processed produce. And so the first stelia outbreak in the produce is in the, you know, uh, coast loss in the 1981s. And literally, you know, where is this caught from the stelia? And physically, the far, you know, this processing grow their cabbages in their farms, and they got diseased animal is sheep, and so then they contaminate cabbage is contaminate in the field with listeria, go into the cabbage store in the refrigerator, cooler, working coolers, and because listeria can survive and grow during the storage, that's why I got in the you know this ninety eight ones outbreak on the coast lot. And after this, you know, we didn't see a big, huge outbreak on here. And maybe we do have the, you know, some out kind of sporadic case, but we didn't have very probably good, you know, identification on there until 2008 and the recent ones on the cantaloupe and apples outbreak. So now, here I want to show you some data on the recent records on the listerias in different fresh produce. And this is, la is this last in uh, October, there is listeria no records in the you know, Grand Mere Smith. And so if we go down, is there is a green beans. And it's also, you know, glucose associated with the corn and also with sprouts. And this sprouts, I want to mention, you know, in this year, this company have third, you know, recall on the listerias associated with their products. So this, you know, it's got big warnings. And it's also there is listeria recalls on the broccoli, as I, you know, frozen foods. And, but uh, do there is, you know, even though I say, you know, meat industry is well controlled, they can still, you know, got listeria, you know, glucose. That means even though, you know, it's kind of very well controlled because of listeria persistence, we need to be really careful on the, you know, environmental sources and is the fruits. Besides, you know, meats, fruits, there is also outbreaks associated with other foods. I'm just very briefly show you this and try to give you the, the whole picture on this. But, uh, you know, historically, it's also listeria associated with pasteurized milk. And literally, we know the milk is pasteurized. So if there is outbreak, probably it's because of pasteurization failures or facilities. And it's associated with also, you know, soft cheese and cheese becoming a consistent issues on the list yes. and i show the list on here it's a small outbreak but no and then there is always associated cheese involved you know this year outbreaks and so the following in the you know 2002 there is outbreak and 13 there is you know outbreak and they are involved the death and it's a several case and so Last year we have the you know outbreak as well. So even this year there is a you know soft cheese outbreak and it's thirty cases and three deaths. So involved in there. So now I already talked about mention on this bluebell creamy outbreak. And so then, you know, I want to come back here again because this outbreak physically is also associated with practice because I don't have very good, you know, practice kind of sanitizing, monitoring, and that's why you know, come back is on the environment, you know, isolate and involve carry on for many years. So now coming to the, our fresh produce, and the listeria becoming a unique challenge to our pr fresh produce. And we all know that our produce is growing in the open environment. And so we have soil, we have water, we have compost, and some 
time is also using the raw manures. So that means, and you know, this gives an opportunity for this area to you know contaminate our produce. And it's also we can control wildlife, both wildlife, and so all those can be you know prevent and causing you know pre harvest contaminations. And we already say that this area is ubiquity in the environment and it can persist in the environment. And that means during the processing lines, there is a chance to contaminate fruit. Even, you know, we come in with clean fruit or produce, and there is a chance to contaminate, to recontaminate during the processing lines. And we don't have, you know, kill steps. And so, literally, for the listeria, it's, heat is very effective. But for us, most of the case, especially fresh produce, we don't have these steps. And so, that's becoming you know, a challenge. Oh, excuse me. That's becoming a challenge on this and washing. So, we do some you know, berries or maybe didn't wash. And so, we do have wash. And it also depends on water qualities. And, and the microbial reduction, we got a reduction, but, but we can't eliminate at all. And so this is coming with antimicrobial washings. And so antimicrobial washing, and there, it's depend on antimicrobial washing solutions. And so it could be have mostly, a, most of the case, there is about you know, two log or less than two log reductions. But it's, if we can come up with effective washing solution is FDA approved to using as a food or produce and this will be solve our problems or you know release the problem on here. And so the another question is for the you know processed berries or you know produce can frozen eliminate the stereos? So now I give you some, share with you some data. And this is the published data on the strawberries. And you can see during, you know, 28 flows storage and the listeria didn't, you know, reduce, it's slightly reduced. But if you add sugars and the listeria keeps well and survive. So that's mean if the fruit is contaminated. If you go to the frozen and the hazard still is there, so it's not you know removed by frozen stage. And so this area, because we all know you know fruit is acidic condition, can this acidic condition control this area growth? So now, and it's, but it's I will show you some research data in the next in a couple of slides. So that means the stele can still grow in the acidic conditions. And another thing, because you know, in the modern pre, uh, processing and packing facility, we try to eliminate, we try to extension shell life. But in this way, so we try to either have clean, eliminate all competitive natural microbials. And when we eliminate all those natural floras and give the steel an opportunity to grow better. And, the early, and when we extension the shell life, that means give the steel an opportunity to grow better and grow the hazard numbers. So this is another issue on here. And so now that's why, but this is zero tolerance. It's becoming control in the processing and packing becoming a very critical. And so I already mentioned, you know, well, this low pH can inhibit the stele glow in the fruit. And uh, so I have a question. Anyone have an idea what's the pH on our fruits? Yes, very good. So it's literally it's very low, three to four. It's very low pH. But, uh, you know, I want to show you the data here. So this is a new data published in this year, and the data indicate listeria can grow in the camel apples. It's acidic conditions. So this is becoming, a, you know, bring a very, you know, important critical question to us. So once listeria contaminated, our acidic pH can't, you know, control it. So that means, you know, we need to be prevent, you know, contaminations. And we know the apple has low acidic condition, and we also know the cameloma has, you know, low water activity. Supposedly, 
the low pH and the low water activity should control the you know, microorganism growth. But in this listeria, the, you know, the, they can grow even in the low temperatures, seven degrees, they grow well. So this beginning are you know, difficult questions on here. So now how can we control this? Well, so I would say you know, we need to go with hurdle technologies. So we need to start with pre-harvest controls. And so we, the idea is we would like have fruit produced and without contaminations. So this is becoming a good agriculture practice, becoming a very important and control our irrigation waters, soils, and we also need to have a good practice of the manures and compounds. And so, we, so here I give, show you some scientific data on survey of the listeria in waters. And you can see from this data, you can see listeria do find you know, in no irrigated waters and irrigation waters. So that means you know, listeria is existing in our environment. And also there is a data indicated that I'm trying to show you and so the listeria you know, prevalence is affected by the positively affected by the, you know, the manure applications, wildlife access, human activities, and it's also, you know, irrigations. And so this is the data, and they show, you know, if you sample right after irrigations, and your prevalence will increase. But, you know, if you let them wait for a couple, a couple weeks, and the insects go down. And it's also, you know, you can see the soil, you know, the cultivars. And but the buffer zone, the study indicate is help to reduce the prevalence. So this is kind of, so, so that means in the our, you know, uh, grow environment, the activity, it's difficult to control it. And so all the in activities will increase the incidence of the listeria prevalence. And so then we will know about the FISMAS. And that's why the FISMAS have critical rules on the manure and compounds to be applied to the, our fields. And there need to be about nine months interval between application of manure and harvest. And it's also is about you know, 45 days between application of compost and the micro stand of the agriculture. So it's kind of, you know, you need to have some time let them die off, periods. So now becoming, we say we control in our pre-harvest environment, we try to control, try to guarantee a produce with minimum or, you know, with very clean, you know, background. And then go to our processing plan, we need to have the post harvest intervention method. And so the, our goal is we try to prevent cross contamination. And if there is pathogen, you know, carry on, we need to eliminate. So that's why coming with the antimicrobial washing steps. And the chlorine is mostly using it and put acetic acid and as you know, when Doc said, you know, it's pretty effective. And there is all other treatment. And we, in our lab, we did, you know, preliminary data on the ozone treatment. And if we found it's pretty effective causing the microbial reduction on the listeria. And it's also, we can have other different sanitizers. And obviously, for others, the FDA actually, you know, it also approved for the biological controls. And this is using the bacteria phage. Probably this is another thing, you know. And we can also do with the physical treatment, like see UVC surface counter interventions. And they did have study indicate if UVC, you know, we pass through to go to the UVC, they were causing one to two log reduction on that. But there is also have high pressure in the process. This is good for the fresh produce, you know, kind of interventions. But it's a shortcoming on this high pressure processing is batch studies. So, and you need to have the, you know, expensive machine and, you know, you put the fruit in, took out. And the irradiation, whether we can use it, yes?
It will help, but it, but it depends on how extensive of what you treatment on there. Definitely, it will help. Are those uh, prevention strategies put up there in any kind of order as far as effectiveness? And this is not, a, you know, kind of on order. Actually, I would say literally, literally right now, in the intervention method targeted to listeria to fresh produce is very limited. That means it needs more research going on on this. Because especially in the past, we are paying a lot of attention on the E. coli 0157H7s, and we pay attention on salmonellas. And so listeria is kind of new kind of foodborne, it, even though listeria itself, it, monocytic itself, it's not new foodborne disease, but it's new hybrid go to the fresh produce outbreaks. And especially bring up to, you know, the 2011 on the cantaloupe outbreaks, and then this year's apple outbreaks, and bring a lot of attention on chaos. And before, most occasionally, you know, still did, you know, it's a big issue on the ready-to-eat meat, and so new kind of, you know, appearance on chaos. Right now, it's not a lot, you know, in... Research over here, but there is, I did, you know, look at the literature, and so there is one of the things, you know, electrolyzed waters, and, you know, there is one study indicated it, they, they compared this, you know, electrolyzed water against a tom pathogen salmonella, you call it 0157H7, and a listeria against inoculated to tomatoes, and they do find, you know, this is pretty effective and causing Less, uh, you know, more than four log reductions. So, but you know, more work, more validation because it's only one paper. So, the more work definitely needed to on this road. Is this a help? Yeah. No. <laughs> so, yes. So, literally, literally, you know, regarding the fresh produce, and I think not a lot, you know, kind of, right now it's not a lot, you know, ready to go, very effective way to intervention it. And I think, you know, the one thing as I showed in the outbreak, we can see, you know, most of the case, you know, when there is an outbreak, and you also found it in the environment. So I think environment control becoming a very important, and not we just focus on the produce itself, so we need to pay attention to environment too. And so for the environment, we can do more harsh condition cleanings. And also I say, you know, steam can be kind of disinfection to the facility, you know, stainless tables for the contact surface because heat is a pretty effective way to eliminate listeria monocytogens. And so this is pretty much the end of my, you know, talks, and I open for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. Does anyone have any questions? I have, I have two questions. One's regarding freezing. Mm -hmm. um, I understand throughout the years, I've, I've always been told freezing is not a, a, a kill step, right? Mm -hmm. primarily because of listeria. And I saw your chart, and that kind of answered my question, um, where you, uh, if we freeze, listeria won't necessarily grow. It grows in refrigerated, but doesn't grow in freezing. Um, and at 28 days, it doesn't really Long die enough. necessarily. Yeah. Right? It's, it just stays there dormant. I assume when the fruit is reaches a certain temperature again, that dormant bacteria is going to come Wrong. back to life. Now, is, do we know, uh, because a lot of us do f frozen products, um, do we know if there's maybe more data for more than that time, let's say 60 days or 90 days or something like that, where potentially listeria would actually die? So the good question here is, actually, you know, frozen, Freeze and actually not just you know listeria can survive and other bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, E. coli 0157H7, Salmonella 
can survive as well. Considerably, in the lab settings, you know, I'm a microbiologist. I'm doing the lab, lab microbiology work all the time. How I keep my culture forever frozen it. So that means, you know, that listeria during the freeze stage, that, that period, you know, that moment, you will kind of have stress to them. Once they survive, they can survive long times. Even though, you know, for this uh, strawberry study, they only can take one, one month because it's not feasible, you know, do many, many, you know, months. But literally, literally this is how we keep the culture in the live settings. So that means, you know, the listeria or other foodborne pathogens can survive in the frozen status. And obviously, in our lab settings, culture is we keep them in the good nutrient mediums. But in the fresh produced conditions, because our fruit is acidic conditions, this may compromise their survival. But they can definitely, I think, my prediction, they can survive longer than more than one month. I'm sorry, did you say that for, for you in your lab setting to, to keep the bacteria we you freeze them. it. Oh. We frozen it, and when we need it, we take this frozen culture and activate, grow again. So it's in the, you know in the minus twenty or minus eighty, we frozen it, and actually to keep the culture quality, the lower temperature is better. So that means you know even you frozen in the minus thirty, probably the still survival better. So a, a lot of us use for some of our process, we use a liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. I know that goes below and it's, 200, whatever. So that's actually better rather than a kill for the, step. For the bacteria, it's better because if you fast frozen them and their survival is better than slow, than slow frozen it. So because this is a large icicle, in a slow, when you do it in the slow frozen, there is a large icicle can damage the steelers. But when you fast it frozen and they survive better. So that's... Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think all of us appreciate that answer in a certain way. Uh, so question two, uh, you were, I, putting pieces together, I know you talked about zero tolerance mm -hmm. for Listeria monocytogenase, but then you have Listeria inoqua. By the word inoqua, you, I, I assume you said, I think you said, is not virulent, is not pathogenic. Okay, so what in the most of case, this is kind of, we need a kind of uh, a little bit of, you know, explain. Most of case, we say zero tolerance listeria is regarding to listeria monocytogen. It's the same thing when we talk about, you know, you call the outbreak. Most time we are talking about you call it 0157 H7 outbreaks. I understand, so, that's the question. So if it's zero tolerance for monocytogenes, minus a lot of our customers ask for listeria species in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. So if I happen to ask Kent to tell me if it's monocytogenous or something else, and it happens to be Inoqua, I can tell a customer, hey, no problem, it's Inoqua, no problem. I can sell it in interstate commerce. I can, yeah, is once, that okay? Yeah, once if you got to the steer positive, definitely you need to hold your product. Go to the identifications. And if it tells me the identification tells me it's Inoqua, I can sell it interstate commerce and I can just market it. So suppose I think probably you know Dr. Russell can address better. Probably I think does that mean it's theoretically okay? it's okay, but the precaution probably you are not sell it. This right. Is I, so, so it's more of a comment. I think it's more. Of, I think the zero tolerance is referring to listeria. Listeria, yeah. General. Yeah. Okay. All right. My recommendation would be is if you had, you found Inocua, because we're in a massively crazy litigious society here, that I would divert that product to a non-ready-to-eat food use if I could. I guess that's what I'm asking. If yeah. I can, I have that option if it's yeah. Inocua. That's right, because right? you, you always... With, with, with monocytogenes, I can't do that. No, you can. You can, um, you can kill, you can heat treat the food with monocytogenes and kill it. But you know, if you released it as a ready, ready to eat food, it's a, it's a time bomb out there, ready to sue you. You know, nobody will get, might, might not get sick, but you know, you're, you're mandated if you find it to, to conduct a class one recall, and so that's always an unpleasant thing to do. Okay. Thank yeah. you. So yeah, but I would uh, 
I would divert it to a, a use where you could, would heat treat it. So any other questions? So in one of your earlier slides, it sounded like you were saying that um, in the absence of, the, of other bacteria, that it thrives. I mean, so if we're using a, a somewhat ineffective kill step, depending on what your list up there was, um, and, we, and we get rid of the salmonella and the e. coli, e. coli and all those others, then it, it leaves a, a spot for it to, I mean, are we facilitating its growth then? So actually, this is very good questions. So what you know, as a microorganism, what I'm talking about is natural existing, you know, even flawless. It's not just pathogenic ones because we know that when we got the fruit, and this is how we do the natural fermentations. We have lactic acid bacteria. We have a lot, you know, no pathogenic. Some is also is beneficial bacteria. But when we treat them, we wash it. We sanitize, you know, washing it, and we eliminate, and we can, you know, the sanitizer, most of our sanitizer can't recognize this is Listeria monocytogen, or this is, you know, lactic acid bacteria. They will eliminate all. So that means you eliminate all the bacteria. So if this is the case, and then during the passing stage, because of the Listeria, you know, ubiquity in the environment, contaminate fruit. And so that's me, you know, this is the only species. So they can use it whatever they are, can use it. But if you consider it, there is natural flora, there is other microorganism in addition to Listeria. They all compete for those available nutrients. So Listeria will not grow so good. And another thing is, if we talk about the lactic acid bacteria, some, you know, natural bacteria, they can produce antimicrobial components. And this can be inhibited sometimes of Listeria glow as well. Is this, is this helps? Other questions? We've got a couple more minutes. All right, then let's give a big thank you to Dr. Zhu. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right I'm gonna try and fix this mic. So we don't have another avalanche. We need to go outside. How's that? Does that sound good? Everybody can hear me? <laughs> well, I think that our next speaker is a little bit taller than me, so we'll try and uh, maybe adjust it for Charles. Thanks for your patience. All right. All right. Well, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Charles Breen. He is now a senior consultant at his own firm, CM Breen LLC, but he has